There are many additional plots that you can choose when you have made a PLS model. One of the more important ones uh, is called XY relation outliers, as shown on the left in the unscrambler. That could also be called the TU score plot. What you plot there is the X score versus the U score for the same number of components. And remember that the whole essential criterion that we use in PLS is that the scores in X and the scores in Y should have maximum covariance. That is the reason why we can predict in PLS, because our X score can be correlated to our Y scores. If there is no such relation, then we have no model, there's no way we are going to be able to predict. So, for that reason, the TU scores can give us some uh, important information. Just remember that you cannot remove half the samples because they don't look nice in a TU plot. That would not make much sense. Even though you can build a nice model, that model will not work uh, for 50% of the new cases because you had to remove 50% uh, of the data to make it work. But what you can see here is, is for example, is there a linear relation approximately between our T and U scores? It doesn't have to be perfectly linear, but you have to have some sort of significant correlation. We do not evaluate that quantitatively, but if you can see that there is a tendency, well, then that is fine. If you can see that there's absolutely no relation, well then you know for sure that there's probably not much sense in uh, extracting more components. Two of the more important things that you can use these plots for is, first of all, you can check for nonlinearities. Very often if you have nonlinearities in your data, that will show up in a TU plot simply as a nonlinearity in the relation between the T and U scores. The other thing is that, and this is quite unique to PLS, you are able to detect outliers samples which are outlying not in X, not in Y, but in the relation between X and Y. So the sample is normal when you look at it from an X perspective, and the sample is normal when you look at it from a Y perspective, but there's something wrong in the relation between X and, and Y. That will show up very clearly as an outlier in one of these plots. So the TU plot is an important diagnostic tool for understanding what the model is doing and maybe for trying to improve a model that is not working sufficiently well. Finally, we have plots that can help us identify outlying samples. If we make the menu item sample outliers, we will get a plot as shown here with four uh, different subplots. Important to remember here is that you have to decide on the number of components because what is shown here is sample variances and leverages both of which depend on the number of components that you choose. So you have to know approximately how many components you need before you can make a meaningful version of this plot. The left upper plot is just a score plot, which is helpful for detecting outliers. The rightmost plot is an influence plot, but now we have residual variance in X, in Y, and then the leverage uh, from X. It can be a little bit confusing to look at, but then you can turn off one of the variance axes to make it more easy to detect outlying samples. The lower plot is showing us residual sample variance. So for example, the first bars in the lower left plot, that's the residual variance in X of the first sample. The blue is the fitted residual variance, and the red bar is the variance when that sample was not including uh, included in calculating the model. We can also make biplots as we could for PCA, and the interpretation of the biplot is exactly similar to PCA, except that now we are not showing the main variation in the data, but we are showing the variation that is important for predicting why. 
apart from that the interpretation is the, pain, is the same we can see which samples are similar which samples are correlated to what variables and which uh, variables are correlated etc etc in order to evaluate a regression model we need some diagnostics to tell us how good the model is how well it is predicting etc the most important error measure that we have is the RMSEP, the root mean squared error of prediction. That's the average error that we get when we predict. So the average error in the Y value. That's the most important error measure. It gives us an indication of the error in Y in absolute value. So in the same scale as your original Y values are. The RMSEP can be split into uh, the standard error and the bias. And the figure shows the difference between the random variation and the systematic variation reflected in the standard error and the bias. These uh, biases and standard errors are usually not used much in these types of regression because the bias is typically close to zero for your calibration model. For new samples though, you can have significant bias if your new samples are not of the same kind as your calibration data. But in general, we tend to use only the RMSEP. Here you can see three different scenarios for uh, predictions. The first upper one where we have a good prediction. In the middle one we have a bias in our prediction. All the predictions are too high compared to the reference values and in the lower plot we have a high standard uh, error so a low accuracy when you predict new samples this plot here shows you what you are doing when you have a new sample you only have the x values for that new samples you don't have the y values and you want to predict those from the X values and from the model that you build on your calibration data. So you have a new X called X new here. If you multiply that with your loadings or your weights, then you get your score values, your X scores T. And from this inner relation between scores in X and Y, you can predict the Y scores U from your T's. If you multiply those Y scores by the loadings in Y, then you get your prediction of Y. That's a long route to take for doing prediction, but it seems to work in practice, plus it has the additional advantage that you can explore your X and Y model as we have shown before through scores, loadings, etc. But there is a way to make this a little bit faster if you are only interested in the predictions we can take all these model parameters and combine them into one matrix by simply multiplying them with each other. Then we get a B matrix, which we will call the regression coefficients. And now it holds that when we predict new samples, we can simply take our new X data, multiply by the regression coefficients, and then we get our Y prediction. Something which we have not discussed in detail and will not do here is that the actual algorithm also involves some additional parameters, but these are not important for understanding the principle. These are merely algorithmic details that we will not discuss here. Also, pre-processing such as censoring and scaling is not explained in these plots uh, in order not to make them more confusing than necessary. So how can we predict a new sample? Well, let's from the regression coefficients. Let's say we have x new and we want to predict the first sample. That's the first row in x new. And from that we want to predict the first y variable. That's the first column in, in y. Well, we simply take the elements in x and multiply them by the corresponding column in b and sum them 
and that will give us our prediction of the first uh, variable in y for the first sample. So we take variable 1 times its regression coefficient, multiply those two, and then we add the next one and the next one, etc. And then we have the prediction. So you can see that variables which have a high regression coefficient, those are very important for the model because that regression coefficient is exactly what we will multiply our x variable with in order to get the prediction. So these regression coefficients are very useful for diagnostic purposes, for understanding the model. What we have explained here is that there are two different routes to predicting. We can go through the model and multiply by loadings, regression coefficients, etc. And we can go directly by calculating the regression coefficients uh, and then just multiplying x by that. There are certain advantages and disadvantages in both approaches, but you don't have to think about the distinction when you do predictions, for example, in Unscrambler. Unscrambler will take care of these things. But it does also show you that the PLS regression is similar to normal regression, for example, multiple linear regression. You get regression coefficients from your PLS model, but the way you get those is through the different models, the PCA-like model of X, the PCA-like model of Y, and the relation between the scores of X and Y. So through these uh, individual models, etc., you get something which is exactly the same structure as a normal regression coefficient. It's just a different way of estimating those regression coefficients.